And one day he talked about, in the middle of a song that celebrated dealing drugs and killing blacks, he made a reference to date rape. And when he made that reference to date rape, that set social media on fire. That got 100,000 petitions in 24 hours. Hey, buddy, date rape is no joke. That had white people standing outside of Reebok in New York saying, you better take this seriously. We're tired of a rape culture in America. We're here at the Midtown New York City Reebok headquarters where people are protesting Rick Ross's lyrics, claiming that he promotes rape. Here's what some of the people have to say. Enough is enough. It is a hate crime to be out there making fun of, making light of, of drugging and raping women. Something that happens all too often in our culture. These are actually 72,000 petitions um, signed by our members all over the country. Every single day that they don't fire Rick Ross, they're saying that they condone rape. Rick Ross is um, a disgrace to humanity. This guy's a joke. One line in one song moved the masses. And you know what Reebok did? Did they stand by him and say, hey, we believe in freedom of speech. We believe in freedom of expression. It's just a song. Calm down. No, they fired his tail on the spot. Mike has a question today, and that's this. How come when you turn on the radio in Jacksonville, or New Orleans, or Chicago, or Little Rock, the only people on the radio that talk about how great it is to kill each other are black? How come that exists? Fifteen stations on a dial, go up, go down. The only people on the radio bragging about getting automatic weapons, gunning each other down, are black. This right here is a song. Uh, my pastoral vocabulary won't let me read the title, uh, but I will read this. Catch a young black male not paying attention at the red light with your AK-47. Let me see you shoot it. You're a killer, you're a killer, you're a killer, you're a killer black male. Let me see you prove it. Why does this exist? I'll take it even further because a lot of time racism exists uh, in what, we, in, in what's, uh, we don't know, what we don't see. Where are the white killers on the radio? Where are the white AK-47 shooters? Where are the white drug dealers? Where are the white people on the radio that brag about what it's like to murder witnesses before trial? The truth is they don't exist. And the question is why? Why don't they exist? Do white people not kill people? Do white people not use AK-47s to shoot each other? I mean, we know, do white people not do drugs? Do they not deal drugs? Of course they do. But why is it that it doesn't make it to our mainstream radio? Why is it that we don't hear it hundreds of times a day in th uh, hundreds of cities across the nation, thousands of plays that say the idea that a black guy would kill another black guy is something to be celebrated, something to be romanticized? And why is it the white people don't do it? And maybe, that, maybe it's because there's no white audience for it. Or maybe it's because it's not really marketable. Maybe because it's not, can't get sponsors. I don't know why it is. Uh, or maybe it's because it's just not the white man's role. Or maybe when white people get up and talk about being drug dealers and AK-47 killers, maybe it's even sicker than that. Maybe when white people do it, they're accused of acting black. The truth is, in America, black murder is normal. Black murder is normal. The idea that a black man or a black woman would be involved in a homicide, either as a perpetrator or a victim, is so common, so broadly accepted that it basically goes unnoticed. The truth of the matter is, black families are affected by homicide at rates of 10 times their white counterparts. There will be more death in the form of homicide involving black people this year than any other form of violence that dominates our national conversation. More than school shootings, mall shootings, mass shootings, workplace shootings, lovers twist, uh, lovers twist that turn violent and bloody, even more than in war and in terrorism, no one will lose their life at greater numbers than black Americans involved in violence. Now, when you talk about what's going on in one segment of society and somehow tie it to what's going on someplace else. You kind of lose people, they detach. This is our unknowing. Prejudice, discrimination, and racism are not the same. We know prejudice, it exists in human hearts and minds. Discrimination exists in hands and policies. But racism is neither in hearts and minds, nor is it really in policies. As a matter of fact, it doesn't take action to keep racism going, it takes inaction. It doesn't take hearts and minds to keep racism going. It actually has to keep things out of people's minds. Racism is like the millstone that churns along in the background. It just goes generation in and generation out and keeps turning out the same generational outcomes. Racism is like the uh, nicotine stains left on the walls after the smoking tenants move out. They take the couch, they take the clock, they take the picture, but the evidence that they've been there still remains. Now when I speak of black murder being normal, I'm talking about the combination of commonality and palatability. You know, black murder in our country is not only common, it's not only frequent, but it's an idea that we celebrate. It's an idea that we say is, is okay. We actually make heroes and, and, out of the notion, heroes out of people 
uh, that trivialize and romanticize it. How common is black murder? Well, in some demographics in the United States, it's very common. According to the CDC, they release a report every year called the LCOD, Leading Cause of Death. And every year, it's been this way year in and year out for the past decade, as far back as they list on their site, at black males ages 15 to 34, the number one cause of death is homicide. The number one cause of death. For white males, it's number three. And when you hear that, you instantly go, well, yeah, I mean, that would seem right. I mean, I know I hear of black-on-black -black crime, or I hear about urban crime. So I guess, yeah, number one to number three, I mean, it's a problem, but it's really not that bad. But the devil is always in the details. The truth of the matter is that if I were to take everybody that dies in, uh, in this year, every black male, 15 to 34, and I brought them into a room December 31st, said, all of you have made it to the afterlife. And I want to take a quick survey. Huh? How many of you got here by cancer? A few voices would say, me. How many of you got here by auto accidents? Me. How many of you died of a heart attack on, a, on an athletic field? Me. And I said, how many of you were gunned down by another human being? And half the room would raise their hands. Now, every time I show this information, people always say, well, if it's the number three cause of death for white males, what is the number one cause of death? And without fail, year after year, it's called unintentional injuries, accidents, falling off a four-wheeler, or crashing a, a, you know, a go-kart, or, or you know, a, a bungee jumping without paying attention to you know, knots and things like that. And so basically, the American story is white kids are dying because they're clumsy, and black kids are dying because they're gunned down. Chicago, just like New Orleans, just like Jacksonville, just like Little Rock, how common is black murder? The past three years, there's been about 1,270 uh, victims of homicide, 2012, all the way up to this week uh, in 2014. And of those victims, 64 were white. Now, this transcends the simple diagnosis that we have. Well, it's education, it's poverty, it's family structure. As you study it locally, nationally, as you study it decade after decade, it doesn't follow any of those easy answers. Something much deeper and much darker is at work. How common is black murder? Well, in my entire life, 1973 to 2014, there has never been a year since I've been breathing that blacks have not been overrepresented in homicide. Never been a year that you can go into a morgue and you don't see blacks overrepresented. It's the story of America. It's certainly the story of America in my lifetime. My question is, what will be the first year that we see it a one-to-one -one ratio? I mean, if it's somewhere between seven to one and 10 to one now, I mean, when will it be one-to-one? -one? We would consider it a huge national victory if we ever got it to five to one, to four to one, to three to one. Violent crime has gone down over the past 40 years. People say, isn't that great? No, because prison has gone up over the past 40 years. And no matter the fact that violent crime has gone down or prison has gone up, what's never closed is the gap. There's always that gap, six to one, seven to one, eight to one. Usually it's the smartest person in the room at this point that yells out from the back, sir, are you saying you want more white people killed? And then all of a sudden I realize that's why we die in clumsy accidents. All right, here we go. <laughs> <clears throat> now, uh, the real question is, why is this going on? Why is this the story of my life? Why is this the story of my country? And everyone in this room falls into one of two categories. You're in one of two categories. Either there's something wrong with them, some core deficiency in black people, they're just prone to violence, and we use anecdotal evidence to talk about that, or there's something wrong with us. And depending on what category you fall in, if there's something wrong with them, you point fingers. Hey, you need to do something. If you say there's something wrong with us, then you roll up your sleeves and you get busy. Well, the truth is there is something wrong with us. And that's years ago we set off a bomb. And that bomb affected our cultural soil. It affected our definitions. It affected our expectations. It affected who we are, how we describe ourselves, and how we describe other people. What we believe down to the core of our being. It's in our air. It's in our cultural water. And it's passed down from generation to generation. Now, again, it would take me a few TED Talks uh, to really get into this. But uh, uh, the, lie, the bomb is about lies. It's about deep lies. One of the lies is that blackness is somehow associated with criminality, sexual deviance, and violence. That when you come across blackness, that inherent in being black, there's some sort of deviance, violence, uh, uh, and criminality associated. And that's a derivative of a greater lie, which is that somehow black life is inferior to white life. That the value of it is less. That, that, that if you were weighed in the scale, the black life just weighs a little less. That if you were trying to cash it in on the street, you'd get a little less money for it. And these are essential to, these are the lies that help build our nation, help build the Western world. Uh, and, and, and here's what's interesting about this, is these lies are not only lies we've told about black people, but we've told to them. I was in an unsolved homicides meeting here in Jacksonville last year, 1,100 unsolved homicides. I was there with the families. They were having a conversation with our sheriff's department. And on the walls were all the pictures of the victims. And you already know the vast majority of the pictures were of uh, black residents of Jacksonville. There were white families there, certainly. And I, I'm not trying to say that it doesn't happen among the white community. Of course it does. But I'll never forget, a mom interrupted the detective. She said, excuse me, I have a question. He said, yes, ma'am. She said, I know you don't know who killed my daughter, but I have a more important question. He said, what is that? She said, when you pick my daughter's body up off the side of the road, she said, how did you do it? He said, what do you mean, how did I do it? She said, well, did you pick her up, and did you set her on the gurney, and did you zip her up in the bag, and did you slide her in the back of the van, and did you shut the doors gently? She said, or did you just pick her up, slam her down, zip her up, and put it in? She says, I want to know how you treated my daughter's body 
when you picked it up off the ground? She said, did you treat it like you would treat a white man's daughter? That's a very interesting question. As though a mother doesn't have enough to deal with, she also has to wonder that when the people working the crime did it, did they work it as somebody's personal precious life was solved, or is it just another dead black kid on the street? Another mother popped up. She said, yeah, I know you don't have the answer to who killed my son. He says, ma'am, you know I would call you if I had it. I want to call you. She said, I, know you, I don't need a phone call. She said, but I do need to know that you pay attention to it. And, and I do need to know that my son's death matters. And here's why. Because she sees the files on, her desk in his, on his desk in her mind. And she sees the stacks in her mind of dead black kids. And she sees the stacks of little white kids. And she just wants to make sure that in the common thing that happens all the time, that her son's life is just as precious as everyone else's. Black murder is normal. I mean, when I talk about it, none of you are really shocked. The most you can say is, well, I didn't know it was that bad, which brings up the real question about palatability. Are we comfortable with it being like this? Are we comfortable? I'm 41 years old. Are we comfortable with living in a nation where this goes on? Well, if we're not comfortable, if we're not okay, are we appalled and outraged? And when I say we, I mean we. Are we appalled and outraged? It, it, that's the question. There are certainly people all over the country doing something about it, but when I discovered that them, them doing something about it is totally different uh, than we doing something about it. Now, a lot of things that you have to understand is this uh, 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 about racism. And when I talk about prejudice, discrimination, and racism, the answer lies right here. It wouldn't seem like the answer is here, but if you want to know how comfortable we are with black murder, you just got to look at the marketplace. When you see this photo one week after Dr. King won the uh, uh, Montgomery bus, a uh, court case, uh, and they decided to, uh, to eliminate the racist policies and the, or the uh, discriminatory policies. Uh, this is his picture. It was a great victory. And you know about the prejudice, you know about the discrimination, but right here on the front of the bus is the racism. Because racism exists in the unchecked and the unchallenged normal. My question is, 60 years later, what in the world is a Pepsi ad doing on the front of a bus company that makes black people sit in the back? What in the world is it doing there? I mean, did the Pepsi CEO look back on that today and go, yeah, you know, yeah, that was a fail. Shouldn't have done that. Are they ashamed? Are they ashamed that, that they would... Well, let me ask you this. Could they do it today? If I started a bus company in Jacksonville and said, I got this great thing, beautiful buses, I want Pepsi's name on it. They said, let's do the deal. I said, but the deal is gays, blacks, and Jews sit at the back. They couldn't put their name on that. Why? Because as American attitudes change, as American definitions change, as American norms change, guess who else has to change? The marketplace. There's certain things they could get away with when that type of thing was normal that they can't get away with now. The same thing not only goes with policy, it goes with entertainment. My favorite cartoon, one of them all time, is Tom and Jerry. This is Mammy Two Shoes. Mammy Two Shoes, you never saw her except for a couple of times above the knees. She was always the one yelling at Thomas the cat for what he was doing. She was voiced by Lillian Randolph, a great radio actress. But here's the interesting thing. White entertainers create white entertainment. They carve out a black role. And the black role that they saw fit was to play this stereotypical black woman. That lasted up until the in the early 50s, then huge, huge protests broke out, and they said, you know what, we don't want to be portrayed like that anymore. And to this day, if you want to watch Tom and Jerry, you go home, you want to watch it on Netflix, you want to watch it on Amazon, this comes up on the screen. It says, what you're about to watch contains some racial stereotypes. They were wrong then, and they're wrong now. They were commonplace. We don't want to edit her out, because that will pretend, that will make it like it never happened. We're going to put her in, but know that we know there's something wrong with this. Now, we don't have Mammy Two Shoes today. You can't get away with it. Nobody, nobody would put it out there. But we do have black people that get on the radio every day in white-owned companies, white-owned stations with white-owned sponsors that play the role of hypersexualized, hypercriminalized male. I ask these advertisers, I say, I've got hundreds of songs a day that celebrate killing animals. Will you put them on your station? They said, no. I've got hundreds of songs a day that talk about assaulting women and, 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 and abusing kids. Would you put them on your station? They said, no. I said, I've got hundreds of songs a day that talk about murdering blacks. Would you put them on your stations? They said, well, that depends. Depends on what? Who it's done by and who it's branded for. Because if we can get black folks to sing about it, we can brand it for our youngest black audiences, I think there's money to be made. I think there's American appetites to see these people that way. I said, how can you say that? They said, well, look, it's what these artists know. It's what they, black people, uh, create. It's a matter of fact, our surveys say it's what they want to hear, which speaks of a sickness. How do we live in a society where somebody says, you know what, I'm inspired to write a song that celebrates murdering another person. And then a person says, I'd like to put that on my station. Another person said, I'd like to pay for it. And then there's people out here in the audience that go, I'd love to hear it, as long as it's black guys. Because even white people buy rap music, buy this type of stuff, because we know that when we want to hear about killing each other, we know who to turn to for that type of inspiration. We call it our music, we say we own it. White people buy more rap than black people. Yeah, but we're very careful to turn it down at the stoplight when other black people are there. Why? Because we know we're just pretending for them it's, it's more authentic and real. I always ask the companies, what about your name? What about your brand? What about your value? And the largest radio company in the world said this, it's okay 
that we only have drug dealers on our black youth stations. We only have murders on our black youth stations. We support black charities. We give out water at the Martin Luther King Parade. I think we've got it covered. We've bought them off. Now, people get upset, the smartest guys in the room again. You're talking about censorship. I don't believe that. I believe in, cen I believe in free art. Make whatever you want. I believe you should make music about anti-Semitism. I believe you should make music about killing dogs. I believe in this country you should make music uh, uh, about uh, bashing homosexuals and driving them behind trucks. I believe you should make music about uh, stringing people up on, on, on trees. I believe you should make music about killing Whitey. I believe you should make all that music. But I also believe that in the mainstream marketplace, people should hesitate associating their name with certain content. You know, there's certain stuff you can't buy at the store. Certain stuff you can't get on iTunes because their brand doesn't want it. But if you want to hear black people celebrate and killing black people, they got thousands and thousands and thousands of those things to sell you. I don't think it's about censorship. I think it's about American cultural hypocrisy. Because here's the truth. These black entertainers, they can't sing just about anything. There's some stuff that'll get them fired. And they get dropped and they get fired and they get slapped on the wrist and they get disciplined all the time. Why? Because sometimes they step over the bounds. A very famous case is what happened with Rick Ross. Rick Ross is the Mammy Two Shoes, one of the many Mammy Two Shoes of our day. He's, he's a black entertainer in a world carved out for him and a role carved out for him by white entertainment companies. And one day he talked about, in the middle of a song that celebrated dealing drugs and killing blacks, he made a reference to date rape. And when he made that reference to date rape, that set social media on fire. That got 100,000 petitions in 24 hours. Hey, buddy, date rape is no joke. That had white people standing outside of Reebok in New York saying, you better take this seriously. We're tired of a rape culture in America. The Midtown New York City Reebok headquarters where people are protesting Rick Ross's lyrics claiming that he promotes rape. Here's what some of the people had to say. Enough is enough. It is a hate crime to be out there making fun of, making light of, of drugging and raping women. Something that happens all too often in our culture. These are actually 72,000 petitions um, signed by our members all over the country at weareultraviolet.org. And there are also comments from people about why they feel like Reebok needs to drop Rick Ross for his recent lyrics about uh, drugging and raping a girl. Every single day that they don't fire Rick Ross, they're saying that they condone rape. Rape is rape no matter what word that you call it. And one of the most important parts about sexual violence is that it's so hidden, we need to speak up against it. I am one of one in four women who are raped when they go to college. As much as there's a lot of misogyny and violence against women celebrated in rap music, it's bigger than rap music. Rick Ross is um, a disgrace to humanity. This guy's a joke. How do you say, uh, you know, I slipped her molly, went home and enjoyed that, and she didn't even know? and then say you didn't mean to condone rape. He knew exactly what he's saying. The fact of the matter is he's just a coward and now he's trying to avoid dealing with it. We'll take her from you and we'll keep him here, all right? Okay, we okay. One line in one song moved the masses. And you know what Reebok did? Did they stand by him and say, hey, we believe in freedom of speech. We believe in freedom of expression. It's just a song, calm down. No, they fired his tail on the spot. The president came out and said, this goes against our high standards. He's gone against the values of our brand. Shame on Rick Ross. We're disappointed. He doesn't know how serious date rape is. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, how convenient. Isn't that amazing? But here's what really happened. It's not their brand. It's not their values. Rick Ross went off script. He was hired to get black customers. And they think that black customers go with black bait. And in America, black bait is the hypercriminalized, hypersexualized portrayal of black people. And as long as he had sung about that, the stuff that got him hired, he still have a job at Reebok. But when he touched other sensitivities that affect us, he lost his job. See, the truth is, it's not they that need to change. It's we that need to change. We, we created the lies. We created them for our profit. We, the, we own the companies. We own the record labels. We own the advertisers, and we keep putting it out. And it's this that's got to change. I thought about it. You know what? I, I wonder if White Mike could get anybody's attention on this. So I stood outside of a Walmart, and I said, hey, uh, I don't think killing cops and killing blacks is very cool. And you know what? It only took seven weeks of Mike Mike standing out there, and they wrote a letter and said, yeah, we don't think it's cool either. We're going to pull our name off of that. The largest retailer in the world had never considered that maybe their commercial shouldn't be right before or after after a song about young black men being gunned down. And I realized this, that black murder is normal, but it should not be. And I realized the importance at the coffee table, at every headline, every pastor's gathering, every family gathering, to say, you know what, these black lives matter. It's not just another black kid. These are human beings. I'm doing my best in every way, shape, and form. Talks like this everywhere I can go to say, you know what, I was born in a world where black murder was normal. My kids were born into a world where black murder is normal. But I don't want to die in a world where black murder is normal. And my five years or ten years away, I don't know, but I'm screaming as high as I can. Let's feel this pain, and let's lift our voice to tell 
tell the lies. They are not criminals. They are not deviants. And their lives are just as important as ours. Thank you very much. Thank you.